Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. Thank you, band and choir. That is a beautiful, beautiful time of worship. What makes Good Friday good? You ever thought about that? Why do we call it Good Friday? It seems very counterintuitive to have not just a person, but the person that we deem the savior of the world. Because he died, we call it Good Friday. I don't know if you've ever pondered that before, and I'll answer that question more in just a moment. But a couple years ago, Liz and I were going through a season of difficulty uh, in our not our marriage, but we were trying to have kids and we were having trouble having kids. And so we went through several initial procedures that were not successful. And so we were told the only way outside of the Lord's intervention that we were going to be able to have children was that if we went to an IVF scenario. And so it was coming up around the time of Mother's Day. And with us serving in a church, there Obviously, is a lot of well-meaning people in the church, but around Mother's Day, you get asked a lot of questions about when you're pre-kids and you've been married for a few years, you kind of get the nudge, when's the baby coming? And so in order to avoid the well-intended but often hurtful questions, we asked to take the day off, and so we drove down to Galveston, and if you've ever driven to Galveston from Houston to Galveston on I-45, as we were driving there, I was sitting in the passenger seat, and off to our right-hand side, there was this cemetery, very large cemetery, it was beautifully set up, and I caught something out of the corner of my eye. Normally, I would have not noticed a cemetery, but I caught something, and I've, I want to show you something in just a moment. I, I, this picture is not an actual picture of what it was, but it's, a, it's the best representation that I could find of what my eyes laid, out, laid on. Check that out. Interesting, isn't it? And when I saw that, I was reminded of why Good Friday is good. It's because death can produce life. That because of Jesus and the fact that he gave his life for us on the cross, but most importantly, that he didn't stay in that grave, that he rose again on that third day, that we have the opportunity to celebrate new life. And I want to turn your attention to the famous story of Jesus's crucifixion. And I want to share with you just three quick observations about the story. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 23. If you don't have one, we'll have it here on the screen for you. And we see that Jesus is brought before Pilate. They want to crucify him. And in verse 18, we see that it says, then a mighty roar rose from the crowd. I want to draw your attention to that phrase there, the crowd. And it says, and with one voice they shouted, kill him, so they're speaking of Jesus, and release Barabbas to us. Then skip over later on. And we're going to pick the story up. Jesus is now on the cross. And in verse 35, we pick up the story. And it says, the crowd watched and the leader scoffed. You see that phrase there again. And it says, he saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. And then it says, the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you're the king of the Jews... Save yourself. I want to draw your attention to the crowd. As I read this story this past week, I was reminded of how many times in my life, and I'm sure in your life as well, that we are just as fickle as that crowd. 
If you remember back just a few days later, for those of us that were here on Palm Sunday, we looked at the passage where the crowd was chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which translated means save now. And many scholars believe that although it was probably some different people in this crowd, there was also probably a significant portion of people that were there for Palm Sunday that were also there at this trial. And this very same crowd that was chanting, save now, is now chanting, crucify, crucify. You know, this idea of us being fickle as humans, it's not new. Obviously, we see it here and we see it throughout the scripture that the Israelites were notorious for getting right with the Lord and then turning their back on the Lord and getting right with the Lord and then turning their back on the Lord. But today, let me encourage you, and over this weekend, as we remember Jesus' sacrifice, let us be thankful that our standing with the Father is not dependent on the highs and lows of our faith. Amen? That it is not by our performance that we are saved. It's not by our pedigree. It's not by the works that we do. That even when we have highs and lows as we seek to follow Jesus, that because of the finished work that was completed on the cross, even when we are similar to this crowd, Jesus sacrifice is good enough for us. I want to draw your attention to another part of the story here. And look at verse 19 in Luke chapter 23. So it says, Barabbas, this criminal that was put next to Jesus, it says, Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Then skip ahead to where now Jesus is on the cross and there are two more criminals that are crucified next to him. And we see this in verse 39. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. And it says, this criminal told Jesus, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Selfish intentions, right? And then it goes on to say, but the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man, speaking of Jesus, he's done nothing wrong. And then this other criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. The second thing that stands out about the story is the criminals. There's three criminals in the story, and in the trial of Jesus, what was notorious in this day, in this culture, is they would release a prisoner on a holy day. And so they brought before the crowd Jesus and Barabbas. Now, to the human mind, this would seem like an obvious choice, wouldn't it? You have Jesus who's done nothing but heal people. He's blessed people. He's served people. And then you have Barabbas, who was the leader of an insurrection. He was a murderer. It seems like an obvious choice, doesn't it? Yet the crowd chose Barabbas to go free, and Jesus willingly and silently to fulfill prophecy took the place on the cross. And as I read this story this past week, I tried to, to imagine what it would be like being there, and Jesus willingly took the place of this known criminal on the cross. And while those of us that are here today, I would in no way try to propose that any of us are known criminals by our today's standards. Still, when you think about the definition of the standard that God set before us, the Bible says that there is no one righteous, not even one, that even one sin is too much for a God who is perfect and holy and righteous. There was a canyon of sin that had to be bridged by Jesus, and we are all guilty before the Father, none righteous, not even one. And then as Jesus hangs on this cross, you've got two more criminals, and this first criminal is in the same camp as Barabbas. This first criminal scoffs at Jesus. He mocks him. And today, we have a choice of how we are going to respond. We can respond like this first criminal that scoffed Jesus. And while most of us probably don't openly do that with our mouth, I think in many ways, if we really reflected on our life, sometimes our actions don't always reflect where our heart may be in wanting to follow Jesus. And 
We can certainly do our best, but our own good deeds are but filthy rags unto the Lord. So we can be like either Barabbas or Jesus in the sense that Barabbas, he left. For all we know, he never turned back and said, thank you, Jesus, you've given me everything. For all we know, he never professed Christ. He just went about his life. And we can be like that, or we can be like this second criminal. And the second criminal tells Jesus, Jesus, remember me in a desperate plea that only a person who knew they were sinful and could not earn their way to heaven. And because of that profession, Jesus then turns to this criminal and says, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to draw your attention to the name tags that you were given. And if you notice, it says, hello, my name is forgiven. You know, like these criminals, what I think the enemy wants to do in our life is he wants to remind us of all of the ways that we fall short, doesn't he? I don't know about you, but in my mind, many times the movie that's playing in my mind is, you're not good enough, you're unloved, you'll never make it. And while in our own human nature, those things are true, but because of Jesus, when we have accepted that free gift of grace, Our name is no longer unloved and unworthy, but it is because of Jesus' sacrifice that when the Father looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees people that are forgiven, that are healed and whole. And so let me encourage you, as you leave here tonight, take this name tag and put it somewhere significant. You could put it in your Bible You could put it somewhere that you can remind yourself if we want to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Let me encourage you to cling to this truth that because of his great sacrifice that we are forgiven and that we can stand before him clean and whole. Let's look at the last thing. Look at verse 33. It says, When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And then it says, and criminals were also crucified, one on his right hand and one on his left hand. And then in verse 44 through 46, we see Jesus is hanging on the cross. And it says, by this time, it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. If anyone ever wondered if he was fully God and fully man, think this is pretty significant right here. And then it says, the light from the sun was gone. And suddenly the curtain from the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. The last thing I want to draw your attention to is the cross. It was at the cross that the penalty was finally paid in full. And when we look at the Gospels, there are several significant statements that Jesus makes on the cross. And if we look in the other Gospels, we see that Jesus, as he is about to breathe his last, he cries out to the Father. He says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? In other words, Father, why have you turned your back on me? That's significant because in Scripture, God's face was a sign of approval. And because the Father turned his back on his own Son, he can turn his face towards us because of that sacrifice. And then in just a few moments, he would, after that phrase, Father, when he cries out, why have you forsaken me? He cries out this phrase that in the English, it's, Three words, but in the Greek, it was only one word, and the word is tetelestai. That word tetelestai was used in business transactions when it it would signify that something was complete, that an exchange had been made, and usually the person who would first cry out tetelestai was the person who initiated the exchange. That phrase translated into the English, you know what it means? It is finished. It's finished. Aren't you grateful today that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, it is finished? 
And we can rest in that truth because of in that moment, he received the father's wrath on him so that we can walk in it. And then he gives his spirit to the father and he breathes his last. I'll close by sharing a story that is completely unrelated, but has everything to do with this passage. So after 9-11 happened, there was a lot of stories of incredible sacrifice that came out. And there was one story about a man named Wells Crother that started to catch the news. And Wells Crother was an equities trader in the South Tower, and he was also a volunteer firefighter. And when the plane hit his tower, he had a choice. He could run for his own safety and flee, or he could offer incredible sacrifice. And he scoured up above where the plane had crashed around the 78th floor or so, and he started gathering people that were stranded there. He, as a matter of fact, he put one woman on his back and, and went 17 flights of stairs down. And time after time at that point when he dropped that woman, he could have easily gone for his own safety. And people that saw him, when he would go back up, he had found he carried a red bandana with him that he put over his face. He became known as the man in the red bandana. No one knew his name at the time, but as stories came out of survivors, they kept describing this man in the red bandana. And the second that his mom heard about this man in the red bandana, she knew it was her son Wells. They estimate that he saved somewhere between 20 and 25 people from his trips down and up, down and up. And every point when he went down, he had a choice. Do I keep going down for my own safety or do I go back up and sacrifice? Wells Crother was killed that day and when the towers collapsed. I've got a picture here that they tried to recreate what he looked like. It's incredible sacrifice, isn't it? Yet that man in the red bandana and his sacrifice pales in comparison to Jesus, fully God, but fully man, and the red bandana of blood that was shed by his sacrifice. When the documentary came out, it said, the man in the red bandana, and it said, he went up so others could come down. Jesus, the God man in the red bandana, he came down so that we could go up. Let's pray.